So why are you learn? Pepsi Alpha. Architecture and the built environment faculty. Yeah. It's a living lab, a funky, inspiring, spacious environment that's home to young designers and passionate researchers. BK City is an international breeding ground for creative thinking, imagination, and both thoughtful and beautiful inventions. It's a place that is buzzing with life from early in the morning till late at night. of people studying, designing, conducting research and acquiring knowledge, it's the place where new ideas come to life. It has its own library, bookshop, print shop, and in the heart of the building there's a model hall. Here you will find every tool you'll ever need to make a fast sketch or a great presentation model, ranging from 3D printers and CNC milling machines to hand saws, large tables, and a model photography booth. Meet up with your fellow students and tutors in the faculty's espresso bar. Or wind down in the Bao Pub, the faculty's own on-campus pub, at the end of the day to exchange thoughts with people from all around the world. The faculty is very internationally oriented. Over 30% of the students enrolled at BK City are from abroad, and visiting professors from all over the world come to Delft to lecture, give workshops, and host seminars. Both renowned for its high academic standards and creative edge, driven, academically interested, ambitious creatives will feel right at home in the faculty. With countless facilities and a staff body consisting of both top-notch academics and internationally famous professionals, BK City supplies the creme de la creme with the best possible environment to flourish. Good afternoon, and we are delighted to welcome you to the general guest lecture featuring Delft University of Technology, titled Computational Methods for Integral Design and Engineering to increase our knowledge and skills in exploration of architectural design ideas through computational design method. My name is Aziz Inasution, and I will be your master of ceremony in today's event. Please let me welcome the Honorable, the Head of Department of Architecture, Universitas Brawijaya, Doctor of Engineering Harry Santosa Honorable Professor Sefir Sariridis, and Dr. Michaela Turin from Delft University of Technology, all lecturers of Department of Architecture, Universitas Brawijaya, students of architecture in Universitas Brawijaya, and all of the distinguished guests and participants. Today's talk is about raising computational approach in the design process at the final level architecture studio lecture. Department of Architecture in Universitas Brawijaya has high hopes to collaborate with foreign lecturers, Association Professor Dr. Michaela Turin from Design Informatics, TU Delft, has ex expertise in computational methods, techniques, and applications for design, construction, and planning to model, analyze, evaluate, and optimize buildings, human and physical performance built environments. Now, allow me to elaborate today's agenda. First, we will hear the opening speech from the head of Department of Architecture in Brawijaya University from Dr. Harry Santosa STMT. And then we are going to hear the introductory and main presentation from Professor Sefir Sayeridis and Dr. Michaela Turin from Delft University of Technology, which will be guided by the moderators. After that, we will have a question and answer session. So prepare questions because this is a rare opportunity to have. Then there are going to be students' presentation followed by the feedbacks. And finally, we will have the final conclusion and closing of today's event and talk. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to listen to the opening speech delivered by the head of Department of Architecture in University of Brawijaya from Dr. Eng of Engineering Harry Santosa STMT, 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Heri Santosa. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to extend my warm regard and thank you very much for the willingness of Professor Sefil Hesari Yudis and Dr. Mikela Turin from TU Delft as guest speaker in the three-in-one program at the Architecture Department, Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Brawijaya. Also, we would like to welcome and thank you to Dr. Mikta Fadil Al-Qadri, which was very helpful in initiating this collaborative activity. Second, I would like to thank you and welcome all participants, students, lecturers, invitees, including all the teams and committees who have coordinated and prepared this event very well. The three-in-one program collaborate with local higher education institution, foreign higher education institution, and the practitioner academics to organize online academic lectures, seminars, and architectural studios. The main object, objective is to, to improve the quality of teaching, learn through practitioner lecturers involvement and collaboration with foreign lectures and international cooperation. This program also aim to increase graduate competency level majoring in architecture toward the architect profession work standard nationally and internationally, which can open fast opportunities for further study and work abroad. In particular, the time of the three-in-one program in 2021 is computational design method and analytic to support learning activities in the designing process of the architectural design studio. This term raises a computational approach in the design process in the architecture studio lecture. Department of Architecture, Universitas Brawijaya has a high expectation of collaborating with design informatics to UDEL, which has expertise in computational method, techniques, and application for design, construction, and planning to model, analysis, evaluate, as well as optimize building performance. On the other hand, this three-in-one program in another session also we invite the collaboration of BIM practitioners and digital engineering, Mr. Aryo Susanto from the University of Western Australia, who has had much experience working in engineering using BIM devices. Overall, the three-in-one program through the term computational design method and analytic in the architecture studio class slowly and gradually is expected to learn and implement a computational technology approach in supporting design studio learning, recent activities in architectural design. I believe this program will bring many advantages in enrichment and updating of learning technology and teaching practices and research activities related to architectural design, including enhancing and developing scientific insight and enlarging a friendship in the broader scientific community. Finally, I hope that this three-in-one program can run smoothly and provide many benefits for all of us. Thank you again to Professor Sefil Sariyudis and Dr. Mikhail Turin. We warmly welcome your presence today. Please enjoy it, and we hope you will be comfortable during this activity. By saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I officially open it the three-in-one guest lecture program today. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Harry Santosa, for the opening speech. Uh, but before we continue, allow me to remind to all participants that kindly you can turn on the camera feature so that we can hear, we can feel the presence of all of the participants. And uh, don't forget to fill the form of your presence in the chat box so that uh, you, we can know that you are present here today. Uh, excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, now let me introduce you the moderators for the introductory and main presentation. The first moderator is Dr. Triandriani Mustikawati, lecturer from Department of Architecture, University of Brawijaya. And the second moderator is Dr. Mikhtar Farid Al-Qadri, a researcher in Design Informatics, Department of Architecture and Engineering Technology in TU Delft. His research stands at the intersection of building performance technology, computational design, and 3D scanning technology. 
The central idea of his research is focused on the application of 3D point cloud data as an input for the development of solar ge geometry in the urban context. We are now continuing to the next agenda. We will hear the introductory presentation from Professor Sefil Sarayildis, which will be guided by Dr. Triandriani. Please welcome Dr. Triandriani and Professor Sefil Sarayildis. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. In this first session, we will have Professor Sefil Sarayildis from the TVL to give the introduction to speech. But before we begin, let me read a short profile of Professor Sefil. Professor Sefil Sarayildis is a professor of design informatics in the Department of Architecture, Engineering and Technology, Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment, Delft University of Technology, Netherlands. She led the chair of design informatics, which deals with research on the development of knowledge in methods, techniques, and tools for performative computational design. The main research topics of the chair are computational intelligence in design and architecture, design configuration and performance assessment, digital design and manufacturing, and integral collaborative design. She has many achievements, as we can see in the slide. And, but the most notable is that she has more than 200 scientific publications. That's so amazing. And her experience in, include uh, the advisor of the Dutch Ministry of Spatial Planning and Environment, and the advisor of the Ministry of Social Affairs in the Netherlands, founder of the Deaf Women of in Science Network, and initiator of collaboration between Dutch and Turkish universities. Okay, that is an outstanding profile of our professor. Now to save the time, please give a warm welcome to Professor Serofil Serigaldis. The time is yours, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I don't know how many people are there as guests, but uh, uh, I would like to first of all, thank very much for this invitation. It is for me great honor and absolutely a big pleasure to be with you. And therefore I would like to take in the first case, uh, Professor Santosa, Azizi and, and many others, which I don't mention, all the organizers and of course, Mikta uh, for, for the organization, for giving us this opportunity to be with you. As I already mentioned, but others didn't hear, in my background, you see very uh, rainy, cold Dutch weather. It is 13 degree here. Uh, and I know Indonesia must be very warm and sunny. I feel your, your faces that very warm, uh, very nice um, feelings. Uh, and I hope we will meet also face to face um, ever. If you want to come to Delphi, you are always very welcome, of course. It is valid for everyone. Well, what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to do an introduction to design informatics. That is the chair uh, which I'm leading at this moment. You have heard. Uh, Thank you very much for the introduction as well. Uh, it will be very short, uh, 20 minutes, around 20 minutes um, presentation. I will try to briefly talk about the... Uh, uh, you, sorry, Ali? No, Hello? No, no, it's okay. Okay. Uh, I was planning to give an introduction about TUDEF uh, Baukunde, what we call ABE, but you already showed that video, so I skipped that part, of course. And I will talk about the research and education activities of the chair design informatics, very briefly. Performance-based computational design, which is the core topic which we deal. And I will give, provide you some examples with the conclusions. Uh, these are the staff members of my, uh, of my chair. I am working with this wonderful, excellent people. And sometimes I am talking about their work, let's say. I am very proud of them. As you know, here, uh, Mikta is already graduated, did his PhD. 
very successfully. Uh, Yanis and Pangwang Pang as well. This year, recently they finished. Uh, I still put them. The rest are working on their PhDs. Uh, our, the organogram of our Faculty of Architecture, we have four main departments, which is architecture, urbanism, architectural engineering and technology, which we belong to, and uh, management and building environment. So in the building technology department, there are four sections, uh, which we are the part of section digital technology, which is established uh, this year. And Michaela Turin, Dr. Turin, is the uh, section leader of that section. And we share this section together with Professor Peter van Ostrom. He is specialist in GIS technology. And we have uh, 60, around 16 professors in our uh, department. I think it is now became even more. And to around 200 staff members and the guest tutors in the department. The chair design informatics uh, is established in 1993. And since then, uh, we are focusing on developing computational methods, tools, and techniques for their applications in design, construction, and planning. Uh, of course, our mission, as any chair uh, has, we, we are doing research and education, and we are focusing on these three main domains, design sciences, building technology, mathematics, and computer science as a core computational design is the topic, what we are daily doing in education and research. Because for me, the added value of the computation is also the integration of different scientific disciplines. That makes the computation very important in our daily lives as well. But what do we mean computational design? It is nothing else than uh, developing and utilizing tool methods and techniques which enable designers to formulate their design needs, requirements and rules, and translate them into algorithms for problem solving, which generate design for design solutions for buildings. But this is an approach which exceeds the use of computation as a representation or drafting tool, which many people think in architecture, which is not anymore. So what, is, what do I mean with an algorithm? Algorithm is, is a step-by-step -step procedure for calculations. It is nothing else than a set of instructions, rules to be followed in calculations or other problem-solving operations and by computers, of course. Computational design field is absolutely fast-growing field. Within every few years, the things are changing, developing, and extending. Our vision is, we believe that the, as architects and engineers and planners, we are responsible for the living environment. Everyone in it is all work. Cities and buildings are the most enduring elements of our living environment and culture. And they are the greatest legacy for the future, besides being the important part of the economy and environment. Built environment, what I mean is buildings and cities, play very important role in the planet in all aspects. Our ultimate goal as engineers and architects to reach optimal, high performance, sustainable buildings and cities for all living entities, not only for human beings, of course, for plants, for animals, and for everyone. Uh, what will be the contribution, what is, let's say, the contribution at this moment uh, to this, uh, sector from product design to urban design by modeling and collaboration in design, construction, manufacturing, realization and operational services, visualization and analysis of the performance of buildings and built environment, uh, as I mentioned, and as an enabler for data, information and knowledge processing, not only the data, but data, information, and knowledge processing, reuse and communication, and as a partner, partner is someone who supports you during your decision processes for decision support. This is the video of our chair design informatics education activity.
We are giving education in master and bachelor education of the faculty. And we have around 400 people. Yes, this was uh, about our education. There is a lot to say, of course, but my time is very limited. So I just showed this video. And if you are interested, of course, you can always uh, contact with us. Uh, we have also a physical lab besides the, uh, for the MSc students and researchers which is called Toys Lama, which we have 3D printers, uh, robots, and uh, also virtual labs, not a virtual lab, it is a physical lab, but what we do uh, on computers, virtual, uh, virtual reality lab and Genesis lab since uh, short, a while, since a while. Uh, okay. Uh, at the chair, of course, there are developments, especially by Piroz Nurian and Sherwin Azadi. They are developing tools for research and education. And also our PhD students, such as Jemre and Berg, they also develop tools for optimization goals. This is called Optimus, Metaheuristic Optimization Plugin for uh, Grasshopper. And it uses uh, intelligent, computational intelligence techniques for the uh, decision-making in conceptual phase of the design. This is a small part, uh, but I'm showing now. Anyhow, um, as I said, uh, our research and education is uh, focused on performance-based computation design. It deals with the treating complexity in design because design is a complex uh, task. It has soft and hard aspects, soft aspects. What I mean is aspects such as form, function, aesthetic, social, cultural, economic, and safety aspects, but also hard aspects such as construction, sustainability, materials, climate and energy, uh, which all ought to be considered in the, the initial phase, conceptual phase of the design. And therefore, to, do, to be able to do that, we are develop, developing and utilizing computational tools, methods, and techniques using various technologies, uh, yeah, such as uh, algorithmic design, parametric design, digital fabrication, and many soft computing technologies. And you can see it in this loop. Um, it is a sort, you can consider it as a 
method, what we do is form generation, uh, performance evaluation of the form, and the optimization in the continuous loop. Uh, besides the form generation, performance evaluation, and analysis and optimization, we also pay a lot of attention to the makeability, means digital production techniques by using robots, 3D printers, from the virtual to the real, from the performance-based computational design in a virtual environment to a real environment by means of computational digital production techniques. And that is why we have, we have established labs. Uh, for us, form follows performance, not only the function, but whole performance. Function is also included in that uh, form follows performance because the buildings are getting more and more complex. And there are a lot of uh, items which have to be considered as mentioned in the conceptual phase of the design from orientation till functional zoning, daylights, thermal comfort, facade design, material properties, and so forth. In the form generation phases, there are various computational design methods and techniques. This what you see is from Professor Achim Menges from University of Stuttgart. This is a kinetic structure which is called responsive architecture. There are various form generation methodologies, as you can see here. Again, what my interest in architecture is a fascination for um, technology on the one hand and the possibilities of design on the other. Um, and to explore this as a kind of spatial system with kind of social and cultural implications that come with it. Biomimicry is the study, um, the understanding and abstraction of principles that can be observed in nature and they are transferred to an application in technology or architecture. So the Elytra filament ruin is an architectural installation in the courtyard that is meant to enrich the visitor's experience of the garden um, and at the same time provide a glimpse of the possible future of the built environment. On the other hand, it is also a live research project where we explore uh, the latest technologies for um, making things robotically, monitoring the resultant structures and conceiving of them not as a final design, but as a kind of space and structure that keeps on evolving and adapting to its environment. Yeah. As you could see from the collaboration with young. Yeah. As you could see from these uh, videos as well from Achim Menges, uh, parametric design or other uh, digital design uh, methods like gen gen genetic design and so on. Uh, connected with the production techniques, such as CAD-CAM technologies and robots, are yeah, really new and ongoing field in, in the architecture. Here, uh, I am going to show you three examples of performance-based computational design in the contemporary building practice. This is a uh, design from Bureau Hapult. Um, they have in-house performance simulation software developed based on nonlinear finite element method to analyze the performance of tensile strength and tensile structures. This is what you see is the wooden grid shell of a uh, small building. It's an entrance uh, in England. Another example is probably, of course, you, you all know it. This is my favorite design, uh, I would say. It is a very good example of integral design and uh, engineering. This building and stadium building in Taiwan by Toyo Ito, Japanese architect, but this is a, it has been a consortium, really, really integral design, it was a teamwork. Um, this building acts as an energy generator for the whole neighborhood. It has a very beautiful form. 
wonderful, of course, function, fulfills the function, but at the same time, uh, integrated all aspects of energy, uh, culture, uh, perhaps, uh, and, and under needs of the society in a sustainable way. This example is from uh, on the neighborhood level of performance-based design from the practice. Example of architect Chong Kun Hin from Singapore. She also uses in her work performance-based design applications, it's methods, and planning. tools. As an architect planner, I love this part because it helps me to design a better living environment for you. Now, what is smart planning? Basically, the first thing I do is to collect all the data about town, the buildings, the roads, the parks, and I put it into the computer. And I'll also collect a lot of information about energy use and waste, for example. And with this information, I can develop a three-dimensional map of Singapore in the computer. Now, what do I do with this information? Well, I can do a lot. I can do a computer model that simulates the wind flows through the town. We're in the tropics, we love the wind. We're not in Chicago. Now, if you look at this diagram, the colors that are yellow and orange means that the wind flows are pretty good. The ones in blue means it's a little bit, it doesn't move so much. So when we did the first cut of Pongo Eco Town, this was the pattern of the wind flow. And then we adjusted the buildings, we moved the parks around, and then you find that the wind flows improve. You see more of the orange and the red colors, which means you get a cooler and a better air quality through the town. Computer simulations can do many things. It can do it at a town level, or we can do it at a precinct level, and we can even do it at a building level. So welcome to Pongo North Shore. It's a town that we've, a precinct we've just designed, which I've just launched for sale. I don't know how many of you applied uh, for a flat there, uh, but I highly recommend it. It's a great place to live, all right? Yeah, I, I also would like to, sh like to sh show you the last part, of course, uh, architects should also sell themselves, sell, sell their work. Uh, but nevertheless, th this is the daily practice now, performance-based computational design. Uh, that is what I wanted to say. It's a long video, TEDx um, lecture of, of her. So if you are interested, uh, of course, you can look at it. This is my last slide conclusion. Why do we need performance-based architecture? because it leads to cost effectiveness, better quality and better client and user satisf satisfactions, offers better conditions for creativity and other value. And performance-based design thinking helps client and designers to gain better knowledge about how a building operates or should operate, prevents designers from tumbling into solutions from the very first beginning without proper understanding of the real client and user needs, provides architects with the tools with integrator in the design process, and offers the opportunity to better use of knowledge and expertise of contractors and suppliers, allowing them to come up with innovative and cost-effective solutions. Helps to fill in the building industry's responsibility for the environment, which is very important, and European and national building regulations legislation are more and more performance based. So everybody should do and work in that direction. And in that sense, performance based design is coming, common, becoming a common practice to some extent, as I showed you a few uh, examples. And it needs an integrated approach and new generation of, of software. And Michaela will more talk about the integrated approach of performance-based design. Last but not least, but I would like to, uh, if I may, I would like to share my ideas with you. If you look at the entire world, there are many hard and soft issues, such as uh, degradation, a lot of problems, wars, this and that. And those problems is waiting for solutions also from scientists, not only, but also from scientists. And if all of us 
because we are the world and we are living in this planet. If all of us in our own way can contribute in solving these problems, I think we can fulfill our uh, being a human being meaning. If you look at the statistics, still 80%, 80, 80% of the world population is living in very poor living circumstances. And you, the young professionals, young architects and engineers, you are the world and you can change it and you can make a contribution. This is my very last words. Once more, I would like to thank very much for this invitation. It was absolutely a great honor and pleasure, a pleasure to be with you and talking to you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Please give a applause to, for Professor Sefil. Thank you, Professor Sefil, for the great introductory speech. I hope uh, your sharing uh, will give us uh, insight about the significance of uh, producing the optimal high performance and uh, sustainable buildings and cities, and how uh, the computation can give a big contribution. Uh, in uh, producing the performance-based computational design. Thank you very much. And uh, before you, we proceed to the next session by Dr. Michela, let all of us uh, have a short photo session uh, with the professor and all of the audience here. So to all of the audiences, please open up the camera and give us your big smile. Okay, uh, maybe uh, Mas Azizi can uh, help me to give the sign. That's yes, photo uh, session, Prof. Sefil. Photo session. Photo session. Photo. Take a photo. Yeah, we will take a screenshot, Professor. So all of you uh, kindly can turn on the camera. Give, so give there, the best there smile. Are, yes. There are 12 slides. Yeah. So we are going to slide by slide. Uh, Okay, the first slide, you can smile, smile, one, two, three, give your best smile. Okay. And then the second slide, one, two, three, smile. Okay, the next slide, the third slide, oh, there are very many persons who attend this event. Okay, the third slide, one, two, three, smile. Okay, and then the fourth, one, two, three. Okay, the fifth slide now. Going to the fifth slide. Your best smile. And then the sixth slide. Okay, that's all from the ones who turn on the camera. Yes, so there's only six slides. Uh, thank you. I give the session back to Dr. Triandriani. Thank you. Thank you, Mas Azizi. And now we are, we will have the second session. Okay, in this second session, we will listen to the main speech delivered by Dr. Michela. Uh, there will be a question and answer session after the speech. Okay, and the audiences can prepare any question and submit it via the Google forms that have been shared by the committee. Uh, now, before we begin, let me give a short profile of Dr. Michaela. Dr. Michaela Turin received her Master of Science degree in architecture at IUAV University of Venice, Italy. She is currently an assistant professor at the Chair of Design Informatics at Delft University of Technology. And her work focuses on computational design for optimization optimization to support the exploration of design alternatives and production to manufacture complex customized geometry. She was married Curie Fellow at Beijing University of Technology and worked at Green World Solution Limited in Beijing. She taught on international events among which the IFOU Summer School 2012 Beijing and Winter School 2013 in Hong Kong. In 2014 till 2016, she was Excellence Overseas Instructor at South China University of Technology 
and awarded a grant by uh, the T State Laboratory of Tropical Building Science. In 2012 till 2015, she was senior lecturer at Yasser University in Turkey. Not to wait any longer, please welcome Dr. Michaela Twin from Delft University of Technology. Okay, Dr. Michaela, the time is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you everyone, uh, uh, all organizers, the professors, uh, Mikta. Uh, my honor to be here. Um, I don't repeat uh, what Savi was already sure, sharing in terms of thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes? Okay. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm gonna therefore share uh, my slides. Uh, Can you now see my screen? Everything is okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, thank you also for the introduction. Um, what I will be doing mostly during this lecture uh, is indeed focusing uh, on uh, some of the methods uh, for uh, integral design uh, uh, and engineering uh, in, in architecture. Now, Sabil has already shared uh, with all of us a bit of uh, introductory overview of what uh, uh, our group does and, and where our focus lies. Uh, and within this uh, larger domain, uh, um, my specific uh, uh, driver here is uh, the intersection uh, between architectural design and building technology. So the perspective and the angle uh, I will be taking uh, by uh, discussing with you today some of the computational methods uh, really focus on this, uh, uh, on this intersection and on how we can uh, develop and use uh, those methods in order to aim at an higher integration of uh, engineering aspects uh, and, and architectural design uh, somehow creativity. Um, and this in this will go through the loop that Sabi was already partially introducing of form generation, performance assessment and optimization, uh, but seeing that as a kind of a complete and integrated approach uh, where the interdisciplinarity of it uh, plays uh, um, in, in the research I develop uh, a key role. Um, the starting point I want to highlight once more is uh, the complexity of the built environment. Um, the built environment at all scales uh, um, is, a, uh, is a very complex uh, system. And uh, the complexity we will be mostly looking at uh, today, or the one I will be trying to highlight the most, uh, is uh, the building scale. Uh, we will be focusing more on uh, uh, today on, on methods uh, with uh, an attention to building scales, to eventually building component scale. But we really must not forget that buildings are part of the urban system, and they do integrate uh, in this higher level of complexity uh, in the urban part. Um, we are very often used to look at buildings uh, as uh, complex systems that uh, uh, should meet a lot of requirements and expectations uh, for uh, human users. And is uh, uh, already quite a, a very broad uh, set of different uh, requirements, what then we call in terms of performances and how they eventually the building uh, is being able to satisfy and to meet uh, the expectation uh, and the requirements that the user should have. And if we think of a user within a building, uh, well, obviously we expect the buildings to be comfortable, uh, climatically speaking, visually speaking, uh, uh, so for, for temperature, daylight and so on, should be safe, structurally safe, uh, but also like protecting from out, outdoor uh, um, eventually uh, and, uh, dangers and, and whatever uh, um, could happen in terms of um, climate, but also in terms of uh, personal protection and so on, um, it should also be pleasing. So if we think of the list of different performances that, that are uh, uh, expected from a building, uh, it's already quite a very vast and diverse uh, range. And this is simply when we think of uh, a human-centered approach. But what I want to highlight uh, is that this is also nowadays more and more not enough. We really need to think uh, of uh, the buildings and the users that are within a building as part of a much larger ecosystem. And now we actually are on planet Earth and now we are part of the natural environment with many other living creatures that we absolutely must not forget when we are actually designing. So we take 
uh, we are used to take uh, the requirements from a user perspective, uh, but and is already a complex task. Uh, but this is actually nowadays absolutely not enough, and we need to have a much higher ambition uh, there. If we look as an example uh, at the 70 UN uh, goals, uh, we can uh, notice immediately how sustainable cities and communities are only one aspect of a much larger set of goals. Uh, they do include uh, um, uh, features and, and, uh, and uh, priorities that must be given also to other aspects of the planet. And we really need to work this out uh, as a system, even when we zoom in uh, in the current challenges and for example, in this case, proposed solutions uh, um, for, uh, uh, for the uh, sustainable city development. Uh, um, well, we really immediately can understand how this has to connect and has to look for solutions that, uh, that take into account uh, also information and facts that comes from, uh, from the other priorities. Uh, and it cannot absolutely be done within uh, monodisciplinary approaches. Uh, this, this is something which, uh, which we need to be more and more aware of nowadays. And in the computational approach, uh, this becomes therefore something which uh, should have come somehow a top priority. So when we think of the decision-making process uh, in buildings, uh, uh, we have nowadays uh, uh, um, a lot of potential that can uh, go throughout the entire uh, uh, pyramid of data information, knowledge, and wisdom. Now, with all the critiques that also this pyramid has, uh, um, uh, has and is not a perfect system, but I think it's still a, a kind of good intuitive reference uh, to start a conversation uh, on this. Uh, um, and our computational uh, uh, methods can eventually help us uh, throughout, uh, um, throughout this, uh, uh, this pyramid in function of uh, decision making within the design. So if we look at the design process, uh, um, I want to, well, in a very simplified manner, uh, to think of uh, um, a, a, a process where uh, uh, we start where already some data information uh, knowledge and uh, capacity of using this knowledge in order to make decisions with the wisdom uh, are actually there and, and kind of there is a, a basis of uh, uh, that allows us to start from and usually we think of using these in order to produce a certain design output surely absolutely true but this i think is uh, uh, is still somehow not the only outcome that we are producing out of the design process um, nowadays uh, i like to to look at this as also a design process as also an opportunity to actually develop uh, during the design process, uh, new data, new information, new knowledge, uh, and therefore also an additional capacity, a new capacity uh, of uh, using this knowledge in order to make a decision. So a kind of new form of wisdom or an enhanced wisdom. Um, and where this, uh, um, this, uh, uh, this potential that we have nowadays more and more uh, uh, stays is also in the potential that computer science is offering to the design process. So how computer science in the intersection with the, uh, the design process can support and enhance and really empower uh, this, uh, uh, the, the opportunity that we have. So what I highlighted is that the outcome of the design uh, uh, is more and more something which is not necessarily only the design solution for a certain specific uh, case, but is something that produces uh, new data information knowledge also that can be eventually applied directly or at least be useful uh, for other cases uh, in, uh, in, in future design, in other designs. Now, of course, there are many different methods that, that can be used when we look at the computational uh, part in order to, uh, to support these and to work uh, within this process. The one that I'm uh, putting forward uh, uh, in this lecture is uh, based on, on this loop that we uh, introduced before. So from form generation, performance assessment, and optimization. In reality, it's kind of this is really simplified. It's, it's much more than this, but I think that this picture is a, uh, is a good starting point. And uh, within this, uh, um, this uh, lecture today, we look especially, as I mentioned, uh, we look at this loop uh, uh, with the idea of integrating uh, the different inputs from uh, uh, several different, uh, uh, different disciplines. Um, now, the aim uh, during this, uh, um, the, the, during today, to me is also somehow to, try to combine uh, two things uh, at the same time. On the one hand, uh, I would like to 
um, provide inspirational examples and, and share with you some of the experiences we had or we are having uh, um, in order to, to really reason together and discuss together where, where we are going, what the potentials are and, and what we could do. And perhaps this might also you know, inspire some of, uh, of your work and vice versa, we can exchange inputs there. And at the same time, and the other thing that I would like to do is kind of follow uh, a little bit more of a didactic uh, approach where we kind of follow a sequence uh, that has uh, uh, a bit of a logic uh, that can build upon uh, some of the crucial questions that we are dealing with as a starting point uh, for then the next uh, session and it will be in October. So I will try to uh, convey also some of the basic uh, um, principles. Um, perhaps some of those are already known to, to many of you, uh, but I understand it might not necessarily be the case. So I also kind of go back to uh, the fundamentals uh, of it. And we kind of follow a step-by-step -step approach, which will have a continuation in the next session uh, in, uh, um, in October. Um, so I will be starting with uh, parametric modeling and give a short uh, introduction now to, um, to parametric modeling. Uh, I will be brief because I do think that the majority of you is familiar with this, but I stress just the key concepts uh, that are relevant to follow um, our discourse. Um, what I think is, is uh, important to realize uh, of the parametric modeling technique uh, um, is the fact that we are not actually, uh, we, we should really not think of it as an opportunity to kind of draw something. It's absolutely not about drawing uh, something in uh, uh, the computer, let's say, um, but it's much more about thinking of the relationships uh, that uh, held together uh, uh, the, uh, the procedure uh, that then will lead to the generation of a certain geometry. But it's really about uh, geometric entities and their relationships. Uh, and how we can organize these uh, in uh, what, at the end, at the moment, you still a kind of hierarchical chain of dependencies where there are uh, uh, input parameters, some of which are independent and we can vary and change eventually, uh, which are being processed uh, along uh, uh, a certain logic, a certain procedure that remains consistent uh, regardless uh, how the changes of those parameters uh, uh, are. This also means that uh, uh, what we obtain out of a parametric model is not a geometric configuration, but is rather uh, uh, an ensemble of different, uh, uh, different possible solutions, what we call somehow the modest solution space. And we really need to look uh, at this as uh, something which can be even sometimes extremely vast, uh, including a, a very large and very high number eventually uh, of uh, uh, kind of possible geometric configurations that still fully respect the associative relationships that we've been building uh, in, uh, in the procedure of, uh, of the geometry. Just to give some uh, examples, some intuitive uh, um, uh, abstract uh, uh, examples, so even with just relatively uh, low number of parameters, so we can achieve uh, very complex uh, and different uh, uh, configurations. Now, what, what is actually this parameterization process and how do we uh, actually parameterize something? Why are we parameterizing something and, and how, can we do, uh, how can we do that? Well, um, the basic, uh, I think, before even we start building a parametric model uh, is actually the understanding of the factors that we play a role in that. Um, the the pre-thinking uh, before we immediately jump into the construction of a parametric model uh, is something which, uh, uh, which should absolutely not be underestimated. Um, I stress here that uh, uh, thinking uh, uh, about uh, um, how to build a parametric model, or what would be the right parameterization process uh, that we uh, write for our uh, intended uh, procedure in that moment uh, is uh, not something which should be limited to the geometry per se, but rather also to what the implication of that geometry is. Um, and in this respect, digital simulations uh, can play a role already even before we start uh, uh, building a parametric model. We are nowadays more and more uh, uh, digital uh, simulation tools that, uh, that are uh, easily available also for uh, preliminary investigations and the importance of preliminary investigations uh, um, it really offers new opportunities uh, to, to uh, emphasize uh, uh, in that moment. 
Um, I will be sharing uh, one example uh, to make it less abstract and, and see what, uh, uh, what we mean with that uh, on, uh, on the emphasis of the importance of this uh, somehow a preparatory uh, collection and generation of, uh, of uh, data and information at the start, even before we, we build a parametric model. Uh, this is a, a rather old uh, uh, work uh, uh, from a former student. Uh, um, the project is much larger than what I will be showing here. Uh, is an interchange uh, station for uh, a transport hub, uh, which was generated uh, by over, as overall shape by taking into account various factors. If you see, for example, wind analysis. But what I will be focusing mostly it is the envelope, um, and this is like the the kind of more detailed level uh, of it in terms of uh, distribution of openings and geometry and the texture of the envelope uh, for daylight. Now the interstate station uh, had a number of specific requirements uh, in, in the different areas and, uh, um, and the student was investigating um, parametrically uh, the distribution of uh, openings and the geometry of the openings in order to kind of meet those requirements. But what I like of this approach is that instead of jumping directly into the parametric model, it, there was a lot of emphasis in a very basic, even at the start, really uh, simple uh, um, kind of understanding, even the, in the physical part. So it, with, with a shoebox uh, of uh, what the effect of the light is. So it, it's really an important relation between the digital uh, um, uh, world and the physical world, grasping what uh, actually certain geometric configuration imply, and then eventually moving into a little bit more sophisticated uh, um, understanding still from the physical part, but with more detailed uh, measurements, in this case with uh, 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 um, uh, looks uh, uh, measurement uh, inside uh, again just something as simple as a, uh, as a, a shoebox both, both with a luxometer and with a, a camera for that and then moving eventually into simulations in order to simulate situations that uh, um, that were not the ones of the of the real environment and at that point therefore getting a, a rather uh, um, a deeper understanding of what potentially good directions are for the geometry. And only at that point start reasoning in terms of parameters, but then the parameters comes out of this awareness that has been gained from uh, the preliminary process. And there is a much higher chance uh, that when this happens in this, uh, in this sequence, uh, the kind of range of parameters that have been identified are somehow already potentially uh, meeting uh, the requirements. So never underestimate the preliminary investigation. We have seen it in, uh, um, in uh, the daylight part, but this would apply to many other uh, um, features. So we, you see here, uh, something very similar that was done with uh, thermal aspects for the thermal morphologies. But also, for example, we do it in research projects with new materials. What you see here is uh, uh, the use of phase change materials uh, uh, and the really close association between uh, using preliminary investigation on understanding how the material works and how the geometry of uh, uh, the envelope that encapsulate uh, the material plays a role actually on the thermal behavior of it, and then working with uh, the parametric models uh, to, to shape and to, to form, find, uh, and, and tune uh, the parameters that are, uh, that are relevant until in this case you see the, the final uh, uh, prototype uh, of this research project. So the parametrization process is something which uh, really I would encourage uh, uh, all of you uh, students who are, uh, who are now approaching uh, uh, this topic. It's really like not something to be just jump uh, into your uh, grasshopper or whatever else, uh, software you're using, file and start parametrizing parameterizing anything you can and is really something which should have a meaning and, and please it's important to take the time uh, to uh, to understand what that meaning is uh, and, and to formulate that into uh, therefore a meaningful uh, set of associations for that. The other important question is uh, well how many parameters how many independent parameters should my model actually uh, include? Um, that's also something which uh, 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 is far from being a trivial uh, 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 answer sometime. Um, it really, again, depends. Uh, depends in this case on what are the meaningful uh, ones. And I would encourage you of thinking uh, um, 
the, let's say, the parametric model and the process of making a parametric model, not necessarily as a linear process where we start with, uh, with an idea, we simply build a file and get a, a, a parametric result out of it. Um, but it's rather really about constantly understanding and using the parametric model also as, a, as an opportunity to, um, to brainstorm and to look at the, at the procedure from different angles and therefore eventually also to revise the procedure. And we have nowadays even more and more computational tools and supports that can actually help us during that process. I uh, give an example here by showing one of the um, case studies of one of our PhDs, Dean Young, who has been working uh, in collaboration with, uh, with practice, uh, uh, Arup and Salim in studio for uh, the hypothetical variation of uh, um, a sport facility uh, in China. And again, the project is larger than, than what I'm showing, but here I'm focusing on uh, the, uh, the roof and how the roof was actually being shaped uh, um, by taking into account daylight criteria and structure criteria, integrating skylights, uh, for uh, the entrance of daylight uh, together with uh, the, structural, uh, uh, the structural system. Now, if we look at this in principle, uh, um, the list of relevant parameters uh, uh, turn out to be eventually um, rather long. Well, we deal sometimes with parametric models that have even many more parameters than these, uh, but anyhow, when we think of uh, uh, the computational power also that is uh, needed to then operate the models, such, such a type of list uh, starts being sometimes rather demanding. So there is really like a question mark uh, on whether uh, is, this, uh, is this worth? Uh, is this uh, something which is really, that corresponds to what is really needed? Um, now, in this case, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, well, here you see, and perhaps for the student that comes from computer science, this is uh, um, rather familiar. And you, you, you see in a clear visualization uh, um, and the, the rather high number of independent parameters that needs to be tested on a certain level of, uh, um, of objectives. But it's in the, in the, it can be a, a computationally expensive uh, uh, process. So the question is, okay, how can we use uh, um, nowadays uh, um, more and more available uh, uh, computational methods uh, that, that help us also ga ga gaining an higher understanding there in order to kind of tune our model uh, on what is really needed? Um, well, there are many different methods. We will see them a little bit more in depth uh, in the next uh, session in October. Uh, but I want just here to highlight the fact that there are what you see here are, for example, uh, uh, parallel coordinates uh, that are based on a clustered uh, set of uh, uh, solutions uh, that try to map uh, different parameters. Uh, like in this case, you see the roof step, uh, the number of roof steps uh, versus the objectives uh, that, uh, that actually are being uh, tested. So the indicators that we would use for the structural performance or uh, the daylight and the opportunity to kind of filter out and understand therefore, uh, okay, how can we achieve certain objectives in the way we want? Uh, where are the ranges of, uh, um, of uh, independent parameters that seems to be more promising in that? And we are now, uh, more and more used to those type of computational methods at the end of the process, but they really highlight how these can definitely be taken in even at the start of the process to help us therefore reduce uh, the, the number of the parameters and help us building therefore a parametric model that, uh, that meets uh, the, um, uh, the, the criteria that, that we actually uh, are looking for uh, um, time by time. So again, the, the question on how many parameters, uh, I, I want to convey the message here that is not uh, uh, necessarily something which, uh, uh, which has a straightforward answer from the, from the beginning, but is rather something where I invite uh, to explore uh, uh, the, um, the potentials that, that are uh, nowadays available for us to better understand uh, what, uh, what is actually needed there. Um, and of course, again, there is, there is a time investment that, is, uh, that needs to be taken into account. Uh, those procedures might be consuming and is always something that, that you need to assess yourself for your project, what is worth to uh, invest more time and when, where the higher understanding is needed and what instead is acceptable to simply proceed uh, uh, also based on some intuition or, co or current knowledge. But that's something which should be really somehow thought and not left uh, uh, at the random, uh, let's say, uh, uh, procedure per se. 
And this also leads to the last point on, on how should we look at the parameterization as something variable or, or as something fixed. Well, we are actually, from what I'm saying now, thinking more and more of uh, uh, this ideal case in which uh, the, the, the parameterization in a parametric model is something that can change over time and eventually include new parameters or new even asso associations in the geometry uh, as soon as we gather information that let us think that something is, uh, is meaningful in a different direction. However, what I want to, uh, to stress is that uh, um, uh, parametric models nowadays are still mostly directional and they uh, kind of still uh, uh, have a, uh, a rather uh, uh, strict hierarchy. And yes, you can loop, you can, you can definitely iterate the models and so on, but nevertheless, the, the way in which they are built is also a time-consuming process. So uh, if you guys are, are working on your projects, uh, um, also really think of, uh, of uh, uh, sometimes it's really useful to start back from sketches and, and you have to rebuild your model, but take once more uh, the time investment into account. Uh, building a parametric model is something which sometimes is time consuming. And that I, I really invite to, to make this uh, um, this, uh, um, yeah, assessment uh, uh, process by process. You will see this is important now in your studies, uh, but it will be more and more important uh, than uh, also in the profession uh, when you will really work with strict deadlines uh, uh, in order to, to deliver uh, what is needed. Um, the, moving now to the next uh, uh, step, uh, on a brief introduction on, on simulations. Well, we, are, we have already um, seen uh, some of the, uh, the potentials of simulation for uh, the preliminary um, uh, investigation. Uh, uh, but uh, simulations can do much more than, than that only, and we can really benefit from them uh, uh, when uh, exploring uh, the solution space of a parametric model. So once you have uh, um, the parametric model that you desire, that is matching the case you need, uh, how can we use actually simulation uh, to assess the performance of eventually uh, one or more different options uh, in, your, uh, in your parametric solution space? So it's uh, really a matter of um, uh, generating certain geometries and then being able to use a uh, uh, numeric performance assessment in order to, to better understand and eventually compare the different options upon certain criteria. Um, the first question in that is, uh, do we do that manually or can we actually eventually couple uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the performance assessment in an automated way? Um, well, there are integrative solutions uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, allows you to work directly uh, on a direct integrated assessment of your parametric model, but it's also uh, still an option to couple them uh, uh, manually when eventually needed. Uh, for the first case, uh, the integrated process, uh, I think like Grasshopper is one of the ones that you might be familiar the most with uh, is not the only option, but it's definitely one of the ones that offers many opportunities to uh, integrate within the same file, the generation of the geometry and the performance assessment. You can use plugins uh, that are uh, for daylight, uh, for uh, thermal aspects, for structural performances uh, and, and many other different criteria within uh, uh, the same file. What I want to stress though, is that when this is not possible, uh, there are also methods eventually to uh, transfer uh, automatically um, in import export uh, uh, mode uh, uh, files, or at least they needed information. Uh, so either the full 3D model or what is needed out of it from uh, the software would generate the geometry um, for, uh, for the process to the one that would uh, assess the, the geometry. And I invite these uh, um, in, in thinking that there is not actually one uh, software that uh, uh, always does everything you need at best. Uh, so the capacity eventually of, uh, of shifting across different softwares uh, and using different tools, uh, depending on what you really need in that moment is something which is definitely beneficial. So uh, please keep an eye also on, uh, on what is uh, eventually in addition to uh, to the procedure that are uh, um, within your own, uh, let's say, integrated uh, uh, approach and, and, and your own, uh, let's say, one software uh, uh, approach. It's really often a matter of combining and, and, and shifting from, uh, from different uh, uh, software environments. Um, another important question uh, that I want to, to let you reflect on uh, when you work on your projects uh, is, uh, um, well, 
there is always a balance that needs to be achieved between uh, uh, what, what is simplistic, I call the speed, uh, versus the level of details. Um, you might be aware, obviously, also on your own experience, that when you build uh, a model, uh, the more detailed it is, the more time consuming it might be. But also when you assess that, if you run a simulation on something which contains plenty of details, uh, um, it is sometimes highly possible that uh, when those details are meaningful for the performance you're assess uh, assessing, the level of accuracy or the precision of the exact number uh, uh, might be higher, uh, but, uh, but it's also like uh, usually not only more time consuming to build, but also uh, time, more time consuming to run in terms of simulation. So that there is really a balance that, that needs to be found. And again, which balance is needed at what um, a stage of your design process really depends. There is not a standard solution that applies to any of your procedures. You have kind of also to think on what is your uh, uh, assessment for. As an example, if you are at the very early stage of the design and what you are actually dealing with is uh, um, generating alternatives in order to compare them upon certain criteria and to understand which design direction is eventually more promising than another design direction, um, well, you might not necessarily need uh, the extreme exact uh, precise number uh, as long as the trend of your results uh, is actually correct. And as long as it, it does allow you to identify that a certain design direction is indeed more promising than another one. But it would be very different if you're instead really working into detailed quantification, uh, certifications or aspects that, that do require a very exact number. So please really be aware of where you are in the design process and what you're using uh, your uh, uh, assessment model uh, um, for. Um, and therefore, building a parametric model and associating that to a certain uh, assessment model uh, is, again, something which, which might have a completely different approach uh, in, depending on, uh, on, on what you're going to use it for. It's always like a process that is kind of goal-oriented. Um, and I want to um, uh, highlight this uh, again with, with a short example. Uh, um, it, this is a... Uh, a large roof that was uh, uh, built uh, several years ago in which uh, uh, we were part, we meaning the TUDELF team, uh, were part of the process uh, uh, regarding uh, the thermal uh, comfort and the daylight comfort underneath uh, this, uh, uh, this large uh, uh, roof. Uh, one of the main challenges uh, um, was the combination of uh, uh, well, the need of, of uh, avoiding as much as possible direct solar radiation because, uh, uh, because it, it would lead to a, a very warm uh, environment, so overeating. Um, but at the same time, uh, the willingness of uh, taking in as much as possible daylight uh, uh, so to, to, to still provide a very um, uh, and bright. Uh, um, environment uh, and also with a with a strong visual connection to the outside and especially to the nearby tower, uh, somehow giving this feeling of, of open air. Now, if we think of this, obviously like there is some conflicting aspect. If we want to leave out the direct sun, we are also leaving out some of the of the daylight, uh, which is that we want to kind of maximize. So there was a, a very um, uh, high attention uh, on the cladding uh, uh, of the roof uh, in order to try to allow uh, these. Uh, and what the solution that was being proposed here was actually an FTE system uh, with pillows that are three dimensional and therefore allows uh, a pattern to have uh, a printed side uh, uh, which would allow the north light uh, to come in, so not the direct radiation, uh, and to instead block. Uh, and create shadow uh, from the um, south and partially east and west uh, west uh, directions uh, of uh, where the direct sun would actually would actually come. But the angle of this opening is something which would have a big effect on this. So at the end, the entire let's say way of reasoning on this was narrowed down to one parameter. There was the angle of so kind of this cutting plane, the red one that you see here in the slide. Um, analyzing the inclination of that uh, would uh, actually, uh, yeah, has led to really uh, largely different results uh, in terms of uh, uh, the underneath uh, uh, conditions. 
and uh, um, what you see here is really like an angle that was just distributed uh, along the entire uh, the entire roof, regardless uh, uh, the specific curvature uh, of it. Now the simulation that were run uh, on uh, on these uh, were rather, uh, uh, let's say, simplified for the initial screening of, of the of the angle, um, where we were really like um, going uh, um, into macro families, uh, let's say, of, uh, of what the effects would be for different configurations. But then once this was done, and we identified what a right, uh, let's say, promising direction could be. Then is the moment when uh, a much much deeper. Uh, um, data simulations that eventually run, and those are like the is, is the more time consuming uh, and, and detailed uh, uh, level of uh, of analysis. Um, again, the, the project is is much more complex than this, but what I want to convey here uh, is that is always a matter of understanding. Uh, what the parametric model is, is for, what the simulations are for, and how we can actually combine them uh, um, at the right moment of, of the process between being kind of general and get, getting the overall direction versus like, di then diving deep uh, into the deeper understanding of the detailed aspects of, uh, of that. Um, the last... Uh, um, let's say module I want to, to introduce uh, is the one that regards uh, the optimization uh, uh, part. Um, in the optimization part, uh, um, well, uh, I, I will have it simplified here, but I will focus first uh, on, uh, uh, let's say, optimization, the use of optimization algorithms per se, as a way to uh, somehow be guided uh, in the search uh, across the, uh, the solution space. Um, of course, like we have seen in, in previous examples, uh, one option is to really manually select uh, certain uh, uh, design solutions to be tested. Um, and, uh, um, and this is really done based on, uh, uh, on knowledge that the design team uh, would have. And this is, of course, highly possible in certain situations. But sometimes the complexity is rather uh, high as well as the solution space may be rather broad. And that is where actually instead those uh, uh, search algorithms helps, uh, can help a lot uh, um, in, uh, in guiding uh, uh, this search uh, in the search of uh, well-performing uh, uh, well solutions. Now, there are many different types of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, simulation algorithms, but what I want to, of uh, optimization algorithms, but uh, let's say what I want to highlight here is uh, the basic of, of uh, all the principle and one of the crucial aspects for a, a large majority of them is in any case that, that, that they, they strive for a certain goal. And that goal is usually like formalized in what we call the optimization objective, um, which is usually either maximizing or minimizing uh, a certain, a certain uh, performance indicator. So you might be searching for uh, um, a design solution that has the maximum indoor daylight uh, or the minimum energy consumption, or uh, and you, you always formulate your goal uh, in terms of, uh, um, of uh, uh, a specific uh, um, target, let's say, that you want to, that you want to achieve. Um, in, uh, um, in the approach of optimization, like the most traditional one and the one that is uh, uh, extremely well established in many disciplines uh, is the single objective optimization, where you really have one clear goal. So you run the optimization procedure for uh, uh, a certain target, uh, maximizing the volume, for example, of, of something. Um, and then usually you have uh, um, one or multiple equivalent solution that will, in any case, lead to one uh, maximum or minimum uh, um, value. But this is kind of uh, um, rarely satisfying in, in architecture. In architecture, if you think of the architectural uh, way of thinking, uh, um, it's very difficult to, to really limit uh, <clears throat> the entire investigation to one objective only. Usually what is needed is combining uh, multiple objectives. Uh, and that is where the multi-objective optimization uh, now starts playing uh, more and more uh, an important role. Uh, um, in that case, there might be even cases in which uh, uh, different objectives are conflicting with each other. Take, for example, the example of, uh, we named it also before, maximum daylight uh, versus minimum solar radiation. So what you might achieve at the end of the optimization is not the identification of uh, uh, one solution, but rather of a set of solutions. 
where uh, some of them are really good at one criteria, some of them are really good at the other criteria, and then there is something which distributes uh, all along what we call the Pareto front, which is the, uh, like the um, ensemble of uh, solutions that are non-dominated uh, by other solutions, so the kind of optimal or near-optimal solutions. Very intuitively, what you see here uh, um, is uh, um, if you're trying to search for a solution that uh, uh, maximizes uh, uh, the luminance and minimizes uh, the glare, uh, you will end up with uh, some solution which has, for example, like we see here, very narrow windows with very big shading system, very good at avoiding glare, but very bad uh, in providing the right illuminance. And vice versa, full glaze facade, which, is, uh, which has a great amount of illuminance, uh, but is also uh, with a very high glare. And then all the gradients in between. Now, this is very interesting because it does leave to the design team uh, the final choice and the final balance. You don't need to pre-decide actually even where you want to be. You can see what the result and the distribution is uh, and then making your choices uh, later on, even in, uh, in uh, somehow more uh, uh, complex uh, uh, models. Um, I think I will skip the example uh, on a single yeah, objective. Sampai gue nemu pertanyaan. Um, is it for me? No, okay. Um, uh, on single objective optimization for a matter of time, uh, but I only want uh, to, uh, to, there was a video here, but I skip it. Uh, um, I only want to highlight that even when it goes in any case into single objective optimization, uh, in this case was about uh, maximizing acoustic absorbance, absorption, uh, is actually still something that can be integrated uh, within design procedures uh, that uh, might still you know, uh, lead to eventually creative and interesting solutions. So I'm not now here putting aside uh, the idea of uh, single objective optimization as long as it is then integrated in the process uh, uh, for what it is uh, and, and, and in a way that, uh, uh, that it serves a larger scope and a larger uh, um, uh, picture of the, entire, uh, of the entire design goal. Focusing more instead on the uh, multi-objective uh, um, optimization, uh, um, that is actually where, uh, um, where uh, we are emphasizing more and more the, the potentials of it. Uh, one important aspect is the combination of uh, soft and qualitative criteria within the strictly quantitative uh, process uh, of, uh, of optimization. Uh, optimization always has this kind of numeric approach, obviously. Um, I will uh, go through it uh, with uh, one short example, uh, uh, again, in, in collaboration with practice, where we were focusing on uh, a shading system, uh, um, where, uh, again, we were aiming at achieving uh, different indoor uh, daylight conditions, uh, and uh, where a parametric model was kind of very simplified at the start to let us uh, uh, um, assess the entire uh, 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 compliance of the daylight uh, for the full facade uh, at once, uh, including uh, a set of different uh, um, different parameters uh, and running uh, an optimization loop uh, that then led uh, to this uh, kind of, uh, uh, well, we have been running multiple optimizations, but in any case, all of them uh, in, in this kind of uh, iterative process of, uh, of different approaches. Uh, were leading to this Pareto front where we were maximizing the daylight compliance with uh, so how well we were actually able to meet the requirements of, uh, of daylight uh, versus the minimization of the amount of material that was needed in order to materialize the, um, the shading system. Um, and what I want to stress here is that, yes, those are both uh, numeric goals. Uh, you, you can really quantify them, but this is still far from uh, um, from uh, capturing and encapsulating all the different even preferences or aesthetic intentions or design drivers that the design team might want to have or even the users might want for their buildings. So the interactivity and the use of the 3D models as a way of brainstorming and even manually inspecting the, the visual appearance of the geometry is something which is of extreme importance. Um, even building uh, prototypes and then going back again into the process and then uh, redefining again the prototypes uh, um, is something which, uh, which has to be more and more part of the optimization process, where the optimization is not about pressing a button and letting an automatic uh, 
um, let's say, procedure happen until we have the solution, but rather they're really using it as a way to bring together uh, the, the design team uh, in order to debate uh, and to take design decisions. And in this respect, for example, we are more and more uh, um, moving also the, into the integration of uh, virtual reality as a way of, uh, of then uh, visually inspecting uh, um, the results as one of the example if you see a student, uh, uh, a student of us. But in, in all cases, what I want to stress is that these uh, uh, and the use of those computational methods for the exploration of the solution space uh, is something which is really an exploratory process. And, uh, um, and looking at, at, uh, at the computation optimization per se as a design exploration process rather than uh, um, as, a, as an automatic uh, one-time procedure, uh, is something that might change also the way in which we look at the optimization per se, where the, um, the problem formulation of the optimization and even the solution space uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the problem per se might be defined and redefined over and over again uh, during the process. We will see um, uh, in the next uh, uh, session in October a little bit of deeper, uh, um, deeper ways also where uh, Again, machine learning techniques can help us uh, in order to, to support uh, uh, this process. But for now, I really want to, uh, to highlight the fact that the term computational optimization nowadays is, uh, is being expanded really more and more into a set of uh, uh, much broader uh, um, computational uh, techniques uh, that help uh, having these uh, more and more interactive and more and more changeable and iterative uh, based on constant reformulations. Uh, during the design process. Um, I will, as I mentioned, uh, uh, approach more in depth for this topic next time, but uh, if you want me well, to, um, to have a look, this is actually one of the references uh, of one of our PhD students that, uh, um, that is actually working uh, on this uh, constant redefinition and reformulation even of design concepts um, by means of support uh, of, uh, of machine learning in the optimization uh, uh, loop. And the very last, and then uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, conclude uh, um, highlight that I want to bring uh, is the fact that uh, all this process uh, really should be seen as, uh, as a collaborative uh, uh, process where uh, uh, it's an opportunity for the different disciplines to bring together uh, their inputs, uh, even when they come from completely different perspectives. I take the example of one of the master courses we are giving. Uh, uh, this is MEGA, is uh, um, a master course where students are actually working in teams uh, and each student has uh, one specific role within the team. So the architect, the structural engineer, the facade engineer, the climate designer, and so on. And therefore they really look at is an assignment, usually an I-rise or a complex of I-rises, um, from the perspective of their own disciplines. And they bring into, uh, into the, the process, the project process, uh, uh, that uh, direct specific uh, uh, disciplinary perspective, but aiming uh, at uh, an integrated uh, result. And this is also how the entire computational process therefore is being seen. How can a single discipline be supported by that, but still be part of this much larger uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, procedure? And how eventually uh, all those uh, uh, design exploration, computationally supported design explorations uh, can facilitate the decision making uh, for the single disciplines, but then also as, uh, as a team uh, of disciplines it needs to come together into an integrated uh, uh, final, uh, um, final result. And this usually really goes into iterating uh, the, the, the procedure with several different software and software environments throughout the different phases of, uh, uh, of the design. Um, also very, very, very closely depending to the, um, the specificities of, uh, uh, of each pro project, of each specific, let's say, um, team goal. Um, this is uh, therefore including, for example, a single objective or, or uh, in any case, monodisciplinary uh, approaches for uh, understanding what the implications would be of certain, uh, of certain design decision, like for example, on the structure or uh, on different aspects uh, of the structure. 
but it also leads to negotiating across different disciplines on how, for example, uh, the structure would have an impact also on the daylight and how can two different engineers uh, together with the architect, uh, uh, the, the structural engineer, the climate engineers together with the architect uh, come to uh, um, uh, an integrated uh, solution that is actually meeting all the different criteria, the hard ones, the numeric ones driven by the optimization and the soft ones that might, the architect also might take into, um, into the scene uh, for, uh, for, for uh, the entire uh, um, aesthetics, functionality and so on of the, entire, uh, of the entire space. In this case, you see an atrium uh, in between some of the towers uh, of, uh, of one project. And this distributes throughout the entire uh, set of uh, um, uh, design phases from the very early stage. So at the, at the beginning in the massing and different, in this case, solar radiation, uh, different understanding of uh, how can we distribute surfaces uh, um, across the different floors uh, uh, of the system uh, um, or interlocking uh, volumes uh, uh, in, uh, in, the um, in the composition of the towers. Uh, and then more into the detail of that, for example, the facade system and what are the implications for energy production and, and indoor uh, climate. Uh, um, or the construction system in case of free form, uh, uh, several students have been investigating and uh, like uh, how to then materialize and build uh, uh, with, with good structural solution, but also good uh, facade solutions that would uh, still allow um, uh, um, uh, economically uh, acceptable uh, uh, solution based on some level of standardization, for example. And so on and so forth. So what I want to highlight here is that uh, uh, really there is a lot of potential to use those processes uh, in different stages and still yet combined with, with all the different means that, that you guys might have, uh, uh, sketching, uh, uh, um, manual modeling, uh, uh, but, but really please take, take advantage in an aware way of what these uh, digital 3D modeling and computational approaches on, on data and information uh, can really bring uh, um, into the process in order to use it uh, in, uh, a collaborative, uh, uh, in a collaborative way to really bring all of you together within, uh, within one uh, team approach. Um, I'm now with this uh, concluding uh, um, the, the uh, today, let's say, um, lecture. Uh, um, what we have been seeing there for is really about, is, is was a rather uh, uh, fast and a bit shallow overview, but at least uh, touching on the basic of the different methods uh, uh, that, uh, um, that, that are part or that are, let's say, um, in, this, in the perspective of, of integration, uh, design integration uh, um, in, uh, in the use of parametric modeling, uh, computational simulations and uh, computational optimization um, is a work in progress in all senses, in the sense that there is still much more uh, that, that can be um, uh, discussed and we will do partially this in the next, uh, um, in the next time. Uh, the next session, but there is also really for some aspect uh, clearly a work in progress uh, in the sense that uh, uh, there are uh, topics that are still uh, subject of research uh, and we are all actually putting our efforts uh, into even further improving uh, the computational uh, methods that nowadays are available. So in that respect, there is really a lot of uh, um, room for new directions that, that uh, some of you also in, in your, uh, for example, PhD studies might, uh, might want to, to bring forward. Um, I'm very happy to then uh, open the, the session for, uh, for the questions. Uh, and uh, if there is any debate, then please also take into account the questions I'm putting on the screen. Uh, uh, I would be very curious to hear also, uh, not only questions, but even the reflections uh, from, uh, from you guys, uh, uh, regardless whether you're on, on the architectural uh, uh, track or on the computer science track. Shall I, uh, this is my uh, last slide and I would actually leave it still open on, uh, on let's say the debate slide. Thank you for the sharing, Dr. Michela. What a Thank you to you. Very interesting presentation you, you shared with us. Uh, it is. It really opens up our perspective the role of computational and integral design. So uh, we have collected questions from the audience. And uh, actually, there are so many inquiries. 
uh, but uh, due to the time limit, uh, we will only uh, choose uh, some question. Sure, and, and if you if you want, my email address is there. So I invite. Yeah. Uh, well, I might, uh, depending on how many they are, I cannot promise that I will be really able to follow up into details with everyone. But I will do my best. Uh, if there is anything left out, uh, I'm still available also later on. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, I will. Uh, you will choose uh, maybe four questions, okay. and I will uh, read the question one by one, and you will. Uh, answer it also one by one. The first question is for uh, Harry. So uh, regarding to the local architecture or traditional architecture that uh, Indonesia has a lot, uh, what uh, can we do with technological advance? What do you think that what we can do with technological advance? Should we complete the, the traditional form or can we adapt it to the form? Please. Yeah, thanks. Oh, that's an extremely relevant question in that. Um, no, I, I obviously absolutely don't have a, a, a specific answer on what should or should not be done. I think that is actually really part of, uh, uh, of uh, um, yeah, quite some deep thinking that, that is uh, uh, needed, uh, but for which indeed uh, then the computational part, I think, uh, uh, can, uh, um, can be extremely helpful, uh, meaning, um, for this specific aspect uh, in the vernacular architecture and in traditional uh, architecture, uh, being that in Indonesia, like in, in any other uh, uh, area, but in general for any, let's say, um, uh, really uh, important uh, um, uh, matters we as architects are dealing with, uh, I think that the computer and the computational process will never provide an answer. So we, we, uh, we can only as architects rely on the, uh, on the computational outputs uh, um, is really as a partner, uh, as something that is collaborating with us uh, to let us uh, understand and better understand the options and the opportunities, uh, uh, but nevertheless still is the team of the designers that is uh, uh, driving the choices and making, uh, and making the decisions. And as such, um, yes, absolutely, the computational process uh, um, can, uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, um, let's say um, we don't work directly on, so I'm not familiar myself with uh, uh, the traditional Indonesian uh, um, architecture per se, not in us at least, um, but the side is I'm absolutely sure uh, uh, the architecture, the computational process uh, can definitely be adapted uh, to any type of architectural approach. There is not uh, uh, a limitation in that, that goes for the parametric modeling part, that goes for the um, uh, simulation part, uh, and obviously for the optimization part. They kind of are uh, um, content unaware at first, uh, meaning they, we need to really look at them as a, a, as a method that can be applied uh, uh, on in principle, any shape, any approach, any architectural style, any architectural uh, feature, but even in principle, any goal. Uh, I mean, they would never, let's say, complain to us uh, as methods per se, if we uh, put the wrong goal on that, right? So we, the, the, the formulation of a certain goal and a certain intention, and therefore driving the entire process in order to meet that goal, uh, well, it's still up to us at the moment. There is, a, there is a, a big responsibility that we have as, as designers in order to, to identify what the right goals or what we think are the right goals. And, and now they are part of this you know, full complexity we were discussing about uh, uh, historically, but also like uh, ecologically and so on and so forth. Um, if we paradoxically put, uh, let's say, a negative, you know, bad intention goal there, uh, well, they would still do the job and they would still, you know, provide a solution for a, a bad uh, option. Um, in that respect, I think that, that really we should not underestimate the responsibility that, uh, that we have in that, which comes also therefore with the potentials. Yes, no doubt, uh, those methods are absolutely applicable to traditional uh, uh, architecture and approaches that would even uh, go for a full conservation of that, if that is, for example, the intention. I don't know if this answers the question, but, uh, but that's, uh, yeah. You, you haven't... Uh... Have you ever uh, studied uh, with computational uh, methods 
uh, with the object of traditional architecture? Um, partially, yes. Um, let's say I, I think that there is much more that can be done uh, in that than the examples I could eventually show. But yes, um, the um, in different uh, let's say um, approaches. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, really in terms of uh, understanding uh, uh, shape and style, uh, and and uh, um, and uh, also like uh, uh, really the. Uh, proportions uh, of that uh, uh, and so on. And the other one is eventually more technical. We had um, a number of projects and I'm just now uh, taking one as an example. Uh, um, um, we had one student uh, uh, that was working with, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, wood and timber systems in a, um, with local uh, um, wood, and this was in India. Uh, really with the intention of uh, revitalizing uh, uh, um, not only, um, let's say, um, traditional approaches, but even traditional techniques uh, and the use of local materials and what used to be, but was more and more disappearing in name of concrete, what used to be the, uh, the use of uh, traditional material with local skills. So even not necessarily with uh, 100% computerized production uh, facilities, but rather really even still with, uh, uh, with crafting uh, at some, uh, some level. And yet the computational process uh, was uh, uh, fully shaped on, uh, um, let's say, uh, generating and supporting the generation of, on the one end, nodes uh, that would allow uh, structural nodes out of timber. Uh, that would allow uh, the manufacturing based on local crafting. So it's a matter of understanding, for example, the local crafting skills uh, uh, and, uh, and how they work and what, what is possible and what you know, shape and geometry is possible or not. Um, and encapsulating that rule in, uh, uh, in, in the procedure, in, in the geometry generation, but also with attention of, uh, for example, uh, or higher attention to, uh, to urgent safety issues is uh, it was an earthquake area. So using the, the, the benefit of joints uh, and, and the eventual mobility and elasticity of them uh, in order to mitigate uh, the risk uh, for, uh, for collapsing in case of uh, seismic events. Um, and this was also like, for example, looking into the Japanese tradition of, uh, of joints uh, and how they, can, they could be made. Uh, this is just an example. And then this was applied into housing and, uh, and then both traditional housing or new construction of, uh, let's say, a little bit modernized uh, uh, um, uh, dwellings. But nevertheless, it really was rooted into uh, local uh, skills and values and materials uh, and so on. And then the understanding of that and the encapsulation of it, uh, of, of that logic, let's say, into the computational model. It's just an example, but to say, um, yes, I think it's a very valuable direction and we are trying to, to invest effort in that as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll go to the next question. Uh, it is from... Uh, Mr. Heru Sufianto, this is actually our, one of our lecturers. Uh, the question is, uh, a design idea should consider the building technology or industry improvement available. How could a complicated design idea that is visualized through parametric computer design model or tool has been implemented or supported by building industry in your country? Um, let me uh, um, check that I understood correctly the question. So indeed, we are talking about integration of architectural design, uh, even complex uh, uh, designs and building technology. And the question is, in a computational approach, uh, how can this link to the local construction uh, industry? Yeah, okay. how can we implement it? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's indeed like a, a, a really relevant uh, uh, point. Um, well, let, let me also make a, a, um, an introduction on that in the sense that uh, um, uh, the construction industry sometimes, I'm not familiar how it is in, in Indonesia, but, but uh, if I look at it in Europe, uh, sometimes it can be rather conservative. So we are uh, kind of used to build in a certain way and there is a certain resistance to, um, to get outside uh, what is the standard, uh, uh, the standard procedure uh, in the construction process. Uh, for multiple reasons, some of which obviously very valid, um, but nevertheless, that's a fact. 
So sometimes there is even the, uh, the challenge of, uh, you know, not being fully uh, able to implement uh, from the industry side, meaning uh, in, in the industry not being fully, uh, uh, let's say, um, I don't know if able is the, the right word, but let's say not having the right framework to fully implement uh, techniques and technologies that are eventually already available, uh, simply because they might not meet yet uh, the, the process of the built, uh, of, of the construction uh, industry per se. So I think that there is a mismatch where we kind of really need to um, better exploit uh, a potential uh, in, uh, in, in a mutual dialogue uh, in the construction system per se. But I leave this, uh, uh, this aspect uh, for a moment aside uh, and uh, um, I take for the time being, the construction system as it is. So uh, looking at, uh, without this idea of, of uh, some, some parts of it might uh, eventually change, but rather taking it for what it is. When I, when I do that, uh, well, yeah, there are definitely methods that, that we try to integrate from the very early stage uh, uh, of the design. So when we think uh, of uh, um, the building technology system within a complex design at the start, uh, it should, in my view, take into account already very closely uh, what would be the construction method at the end. And either we, we have a decision on that already, or we might even compare different design, different construction processes, uh, and, and therefore even be sometimes directly in contact with different uh, uh, constructors and different really like firms that would then uh, take over the, the construction to see how we could implement that approach uh, in uh, the kind of rules uh, and, and, uh, and thinking at the very start. Uh, I would never recommend to go on with the design of a certain building and certain building technology related aspects uh, and then start thinking of how to construct and how to build it or searching for uh, uh, you know, industries uh, that, that could make that possible because there there is really eventually a gap. So it's always a matter of trying to involve them at the very early stage from the start. Um, and now we do this in, uh, in, in two different ways, Some, sometimes really like playing 100% according to uh, uh, what is available uh, uh, at the moment. And sometimes it's uh, taking a more research-oriented approach, so looking together with them at what it could be that like we are trying to implement, for example, 3D printing at a large scale that is not a standard uh, construction method yet. But will it be, can it be, if it's gonna be, how it's gonna be, is something which again needs to be really discussed very closely with, with the industry. So yes, they are key players, but in my view, they are key players from the very start. Yeah. Okay. And again, I don't know if, if this exactly answer is, I'm not providing answers, but rather like a, a work in progress uh, uh, because we don't have final solutions on, uh, on any of those points, obviously. Okay. Okay, due to the time limit, maybe uh, that will be the last question for this session. So we are very sorry for uh, the other question that cannot be accommodated. Uh, but uh, uh, further inquiry can be uh, asked by email, right? Uh, can, uh, can the audience uh, send you further question by... Uh, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, again, okay, I, I, I don't promise to be very fast in reacting to everyone, but yes, definitely, please do so, and I will do my best to, to follow up. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the next session will be the student's presentation, and I will give the, uh, the session back to the Mas Azizi. Yes, thank you. stop sharing then. Thank you for Dr. Randiani and Dr. Michaela Turin for the uh, amazing presentation that uh, opening our eyes about the computational technology of architecture. And then uh, the next agenda will be students' presentation. Uh, the students' presentation will be from the architectural studio lecture and then from architectural competition and architectural thesis that will be delivered by uh, Alifi Majid and then Sevilla Tiara Nugroho, and then myself, Azizia Kalahak, with my partner, Najwa Chika. And then the next uh, will be Exa Corina, and the last will be Sriwati Adrina Sani. Uh, to remind, there will be a time limit. There's only three minutes to, for us to present. So uh, uh, let me call Alifi Majid. You can start your presentation now. Okay. 
Uh, am I audible? All right. Yes, we uh, can thank hear you. you. Yeah. Good evening. I hope this is fancy well. My name is Alvin Majid from Brawijaya University. On this great occasion, I'd like to present my final architectural design with the title of Inner Forest, Korean War Memorial Park for Civil Victims. And this project was supervised by Miss India uh, Martin Ingram. Next, please. To begin with the background issue, nowadays it's been 21 years since the crutches and resentment of Supreme Wars were buried and sealed between the nameless mountain and valleys. Ironically, this even has become a forgotten war in this contemporary era. Next, please. The story of the outbreak of the Korean War must have a strong connection with the site. Uh, next, please. Yeah, the chosen site is at Nangwoldong, seat of the uh, previous light Republic of Korea, with an approximate site of 10 hectares. Yeah, next. Uh, this project uses a pragmatic design approach with uh, following six design parameters. We can see this uh, in the yellow box on the right slide. Uh, I'm sorry, previous slide. Uh, sorry, previous one. Uh, yeah, this. and these parameters are obtained from poem, historical video, and literature about the Korean War. Uh, I also have done with small research about the Korean sensitivity of souls and architecture. Next, please. Uh, I have three models uh, in the design experimental, and this is my first perspective model. Uh, for the first step, I determine the major axis in the center of the site and following by meso axis to make it balance. Uh, as I note, uh, at this step, I have no input uh, the variable of river. So we can see that many men nor pedestrian ways pass through to the river. However, it was fine to do a quality of content evaluation since it still has two parameters outside uh, of the natural environment. Next, please. And this is my second model. On this stage, I've been focusing on building because two parameters have been added, which are mostly about the scenery of Memorial Park. To begin with the remembering stage, the cube of the space was cut and extended vertically to increase the NQs uh, of the sun. Uh, after that, the biggest plane we was subtracted to allow access to the natural environment. Furthermore, the forgetting stage left a monumental impression and has a small elongated like this to allow sun and glimmer to enter the hallway. Refer to forgiving stage is given visual access to the water and driver with a transparent material. Next, please. And this is my third model. In this model, it will have been evaluated with all of the parameters. Therefore, since the natural and from parameters have been added at this predictive stage, the minor of pedestrian base was subtracted by the driver as a variable. You can see the circle shape uh, mask and also give a visualization of the scenery materials and utilities in this in the memorial building. Next, please. Due to limitation of the working time uh, for my for this step, uh, and since the quality of content evaluation was done without negative points, both my supervisor uh, and I decided to make it final on the third model. Next, please. And this is my final set plan. Next, please. And this is my set section. And next, please. And actually, I had done three building of schematic drawing, and this is one of them, but memorial building. Next, please. And this is the serial vision of Inner Forest Memorial Park. Uh, start from the entrance site, parking area, and welcome center with the shadow and light concept, and the underground display to learn about their past. Next, please. Uh, the design also has a spiritual experience of the outbreak of the Korean War, divided into three sections. The first section is about re-entering the forest. The second section is emptiness on the left slide. Uh, and the last stage is a bloom uh, as a forgiving stage with a Daniel and Garden concept that has a meaning of life. Next, please. And thank you for the attention. I hope we also don't sleep with our pastor. Thank you.
Thank you for the presentation, uh, Mas Alifi. Moving on to the next presentation that will be presented by Sevilla Tiara Nugroho. Uh, you can yeah. start the presentation now. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sevilla, and this on very special occasion, I would like to present my latest architectural design uh, that I designed a general hospital that based on the healing and the green architectural concept. Next. So the hospital is a type B uh, classified hospital with a total of 20 stories. So it's classified as a high rise building with the main focus on creating a healing and comfortable environment by the approach of architecture and design. Next. Uh, so there are four main issues for my design process. The first of all, as we can know, uh, in this kind of situation, we can see very strategy that involves of the collapse of several healthcare facility due to the unpreparedness of the global pandemic. That's why I'm focusing to make a building that very strong and uh, com competent to, for a healthcare facilities that need it in the kind of uh, situation. The next one is I want to implementing the green hospital concept as a response to climate condition, especially in the tropical uh, area in Indonesia. And the next one, I want to prioritize the patient recovery by providing a healing ambience in the middle of the Jakarta that uh, labeled as the worst uh, of the pollution. So that's why it's such a challenge to create a healthy environment in the middle of the unhealthy situation. So uh, that's the main thing. And also the last one is I want to create uh, something that give uh, high capital investment value. So there are uh, two different approaches next uh, about designing. The first one is using uh, Pragmatism by uh, choosing several precedents that I modify into the site and also alongside with the climate ex effect and eventually made a three uh, point, a key point for my design. And also about the design fundamental, I'm using an evidence-based design. This is designed based on a scientific analysis method that focusing on regulation, journal, and books. Next. Uh, this is the isometric diagram for my hospital. As you can see, there are two towers that focusing on the non-infectious area and the infectious area. Uh, there I will elaborate more in the next slide. Next. So this is actually the resolution as the solution of the issue that I elaborate in the uh, first slide. So the double tower is actually designed to be a tower that specify for the infectious disease and the non-communicable disease area, or as we can say, a non-infectious disease. So along with that, uh, we also have the sterilization area in the middle of the infectious and the non-infectious disease. So the both set can cannot infect one each other. As you can see in the first floor, there are an emergency room. The emergency room is a uh, divided into two separate area, the, the emergency room for the infectious, infectious area and the non-infectious area. And in the middle of it, there also a sterilization area for the healthcare facilitator to not get uh, infected by the middle of the process of the healthcare facility. And also in the ninth floor, there are also a bridge that connecting to uh, the tower, that the main tower and the secondary tower. They also have sterilization area to keep both area separated and uh, sterile for uh, one tower and each other. Next. Uh, this is the uh, approach of the uh, efficient base design that I use. I'm using a healing garden uh, that wrote on a scientific paper written by Professor uh, Roger from the Texas University. It stated that uh, a hospital that have a well-designed garden can help calm patient and furthermore will also be for the foster improvement to the clinical outcome that can reducing the start shortening of the hospital stay. And I think it's play a major factor for the hospital to create such a healthy facility that can help the patient to achieve uh, the faster recovery as it should be. Next. Uh, and also uh, the aim of the interior design due to the restriction of the regulation of the hospital itself, I want to make sure the interior play a big role to the hospital. That's why on the outpatient department, I want to make it as, more, as much as more alike so it will 
uh, eliminate the eeriness, the scariness of the hospital, along with the gift like the active and the modern impression of the hospital. And also in the inpatient uh, department, I want to make it uh, as comfortable as it can be. So it can give like homey impression and that can lead into the improvement of the patient recovery process. Next. Uh, and also, last but not least, uh, the design is a never-ending process, so there's always be a room for improvement, as well as increasing the investment value for my building, because I see there are several cases here that know the hospital can also be uh, featured as a hotel to provide an isolation room to intensive care for the global pandemic. And also, I want to advance the more of the waste disposal in the hospital and uh, the last one is I want to revamp the microclimate system into more micro to have the uh, to have the effect of the stack garden uh, on the east side of the building along with the uh, photo photo volcanic uh, solar panel that can help uh, with the secondary energy for the building itself. I think that's all about the presentation. I hope it can give you a little bit insight about my design process and how I uh, made the choices along the design. And thank you very much for this amazing opportunity. Uh, my name is Sefila Tiaran Gro. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, thank you, uh, Sefila Tiara. And now uh, I will uh, call myself and my partner here, uh, my partner Chika. So, uh, compared to the previous presentation, this is a rather simple project. So this is a transit a project from a competition that our, we participated uh, a few times ago. So it's uh, we got to the top 15 of the competition and we are now going to present it. Uh, so transit is a word that consists of two things. It's run and sit. So it's a playground or a park and it contains the feature of interaction and recreation. Uh, this competition is held by uh, the Unifer Architecture Department of University of Indonesia. Next slide. Okay, as you know, we are currently facing the COVID-19 pandemic. And during this pandemic, we are all required to do all the things from home. The office work turns into work from home, study at school and campuses turns into remote learning like this. And as a result of this phenomenon, we all end up spending most of our days sitting in front of computer, mobile phone, or simply just sleeping and eating. And because of all these things, the movement of our body is reduced drastically and slowly erodes our physical health. And I want to underline that this pandemic has left us with the two main things that people are bound to do. The first thing is move and the second thing is interact with other people. Next, please. Okay, so the challenge from the competition is how to design a public space that can accommodate people so that they can move, interact, and play. But there's another challenge from the competition, which is the budget is only limited to 4.5 million rupiah. That's about $300 for a uh, public space. Uh, so we attempt to respond to the issue and the challenge with designing an open public space using your used materials as the main feature. The materials uh, used in this design is uh, wood pallets, and then tires, bottles, and bottle crates. Uh, next. The main concept of the design is to create a variety of activities that encourage people to go out and do the things they can during the pandemic. Here are the things that consist in our design. So we want to make a public space that can encourage people to be active, uh, to have interaction, recreation, healing, and to present with nature and to build a better community in their place. Next. And to realize the main concept that have been explained before, Transit provide five main facilities. The first facilities is the colorful track, and then the fun slide, railing garden, colorful sitting area, and flexible play space. Next. So as you can see, there are two curvy shaped wooden lanes that face each other, right? So the first one is a track, a running track or a walking track made from stacked wood pallet and decorated with a railing garden, creating an atmosphere of nature and fatigue relieving while walking or running on it. It's also connected to a pair of slides so that 
so that children and kids can slide down happily after they run on the track. So on the other side is another lane of stacked wood pallet that acts as a sitting area. So there are a playing area and then a sitting area so that the parents can sit here while watching their children play. And of course, anyone can sit here and relax, interacting with others and enjoying the cozy atmosphere of transit. Next. And the last facility is flexible space located in the middle of this open public space. This space was created to increase community engagement. How can this space increase community engagement? So this space can flexibly change according to existing needs or occasion. It can be a space to play, watch movies together, exercise together, or even a space to, ho to hold a weekly bazaar. Next. Okay, that's all from us. Uh, we hope we can get uh, beneficial information from our presentation. We sincerely appreciate uh, the opportunity and your attention today. Good afternoon and have a good day. Thank you. So uh, now I'm going to call the next presenter uh, to Exa Corina Azalea Suchipto. Uh, time is yours. Sorry, this is time for Stewate Aji Nasani. Um, I'm sorry, the presentation is mine, but it's not my turn that I call. So here, it's my, it's my turn. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, so the slide shows that uh, it's from Stewate Aji Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, you can start the presentation. Uh, but okay, uh, before, I'm sorry that I'm not using the virtual background because there's some problem with the Zoom. But uh, good evening, my name is Stewate Aji Nasani and I would like to present you my thesis with the title Morphogenesis of Durung at Sumberwaru Bawian Gresik. Next. This research starts with a question from the lecturer in our discussions in class, which is in which directions will our traditions and cultural identity go as the world keep advancing to the future? Next. And with that question, we finally found that there is one key to this research and that work is change. Change is something that is inevitable to happen in a progressive society. And this change can happen based on several factors such as natural conditions, technology, and the activities as the result of adaptation to civilizations. And it can occur by either considering the human needs in general or in specifics. And change is a form of adaptations. And in this case, we are focusing on the housing which Batubara said was the manifestations of their community system and represent the intellectual values, customs, and beliefs to their community. So when these values, customs, and beliefs change, the housing itself will try to adapt to adjust to the new one. There's a lot of change in our structures. There are transformations, morphology, but here we're focusing on morphogenesis. I've gathered of several the definitions of morphogenesis, like from Osterlund, Wang and Yuan, Rodowski, but we can try to simply simplicate it by telling that morphogenesis can be interpreted as a process of transformations of an object to form an as a form of adaptations and response to the factors that affect it. Next. The location of the study is at a small hamlet at Bawean Islands, Gresik is Java, which is called Sumberwaru, that's located at Paromaan Village, Tambak. This village uh, built on 1970 and was populated by only 74 families. In Bawean, there is a tr traditional building that used as a granary called Durung. And in Sumberwaru itself, the Durung is still used until this day. Yet the main functions as granary is changed and adapted by time to time. Next. Next, please. Uh, this, I'm sorry, previous, uh, the previous slide. By collecting uh, the 71 sample of Dorong and Sumberwaru, the goals of this research is trying to find out the morphogenesis that happens in Dorong and Sumberwaru by using these variables that shown in the screen. Next. 
uh, I try to map mapping and trying to collecting the data of every variable that exists in sumber in Durung sumber in sumber waru and trying to find a pattern of what change and what not in the Durung at sumber waru. And from this information, next please. Next please. As transfer is from this information, then it's uh, processed into a data about the uh, about what change and what not. Like oh, yeah. trying uh, from the physicals, the spatials, and the cultural uh, factors that happens to the durung itself. Next. No, no, in BB ada step ya. And after collecting every data from the locations, I try to build a graph that uh, trying to figuring out what uh, the, the the change that happens in the in the physicals of Durung and how it affected by the cultural and social activities that happens around and what kind of change that happens in particular orientations of the Durung itself. And it starts, uh, it finally resulting a pattern, which we can conclude as next. The morphogenesis that happens in Durung at Sumberwaru is very strongly influenced by the relationship between the orientations and the activities of its inhabitants. And the orientations and the positions is uh, affecting how the activities happens in the more secluded area. They use the durung for more private activities such as cooking and uh, sharing with their neighborhoods. But in the area that more exposed to public, they use it for a gathering and for the children to playing around and involving many villagers at once. And durung uh, have a high intensity of activities usually change more than the durung that didn't have a lot of activities that happens at, to, in that place time to time. And that's all what I can uh, present like today. Thank you. Thank you to Mbak Adrina. And then we will continue to the uh, last presentation by Exocorina. Uh, time is yours. You can start presenting now. Okay, good evening, the honorable ladies and gentlemen. My name is Exa, and I am from Brawijaya University. In this very good occasion, I like to present my research paper entitled Development of HBM Library Object Based on Parametric Modeling for Historic Buildings of Ijen Church in Malang. Next, please. Okay, before we go through to substantial, I like to share this research background to all of you first. Archives of historical buildings are almost all by analog or paper design drawings. And also some of heritage buildings in the world have been damaged or destroyed, which erasing thousand years of culture and history. So this will be emergence for preserved heritage building. Then recently, there are technologies to scanning historical buildings, better accuracy using laser scanning. And there are development from BIM, ESH BIM, which is according to Oreni in 2014 are possible solution for 3D parametric representation, which enables to draw models and manage data on historic architectural elements. So we can conclude issues. It is necessary to preserve historic building by digitalization. In this research, the approach is HBIM or historical building information modeling for parametric object library which later is to aim produce development of HBM library object based on parametric modeling of case study IJN Church in Malang. Next, please. Okay, first step forward the HB model began with the laser scanning survey. You can look at the pictures number two. Those are the points where the church scans are carried out. Total, there are 47 individual scans with over 1,195,000 data points. Pictures number three is data 3D point cloud, result of scan using RTC 360. Every individual scan just need two minutes. 
So the whole building scan takes just a few hours. Next. Afterwards, 3D data point cloud should go through post-processing to registering, cleaning noise, and global registration. And the next step is to convert the data so that it can be entered into the Revit software for modeling purpose. Next. Okay, third step is doing tracing and leveling in Revit software. This step aims to produce basic modeling according to the actual size in existing. Next. The basic, the basic modeling was then developed into advanced modeling in Archicad software through several steps. Next. Afterward, to perform parametric object modeling can go through two workflows. First workflow using Revit, Archicad, and SketchUp. This workflow is carried out to perform modeling on non-regular shape and organic shape. Meanwhile, the second workflow uses Revit and Archicad. This workflow is done by directly developing parametric object by changing object parameters in the BIM default library. Next. This is the result of the parametric object library, which there are parameters that contain information and can be changed as need. Next. And this is the result of the whole EGEN building with the HBIM parametric object library next after being combined. Okay, so yeah, next. That is all for me. Thank you for your attention. May it will be beneficial for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for all the students who have presented their projects. And now we are going to hear from Dr. Michaela Turin for the feedback of the overall of the student's project. Uh, so I would like to call Dr. Michaela to speak up. Yeah. Uh, the time is yours. Thank you. And, and thank you very much, all of you guys. Uh, really, like I'm, I'm very impressed and engaged uh, uh, from the presentation I have seen. Um, I'm sorry, we only have a, a rather short amount of time to, to interact. The project was actually deserve much more uh, conversation and I hope there will be future occasions uh, uh, also to do that. Um, but so I will be a, a bit brief, uh, but, but really not because of uh, uh, lack of interest, but just really for a matter of uh, uh, respecting the timeline. Um, I, what what uh, was intriguing me uh, very much, and of course I will take you know, a computational uh, perspective, though your projects were much more rich than, than only the computational part. Um, but if I take the computational perspective, what I was very intrigued uh, in, uh, in all of your projects was actually, again, the combination of different aspects. And I think this was, this is something that was regardless the specific application that all of you was uh, dealing with individually. Uh, but in all of the projects, there was uh, uh, this obviously uh, large attention to materiality or uh, to certain comfort parameters uh, or to certain, uh, you know, really, again, numerically quantifiable performances versus uh, qualities that you were trying to, uh, to um, associate uh, uh, and recreate within your space. Uh, and that includes different type of qualities, uh, as some of you dealing with, uh, with uh, comfort for patients, some of you, in, in, even like the healing space, some of you linking back to the memory and, and the respect of what has happened uh, in, in the past uh, on uh, uh, past events or uh, culture that comes and we still want to preserve and bring forward values of collectivity and aggregating society. So in all of the project, there was like this richness on a different perspectives. And I will try now to just very briefly one by one go through, uh, through ideas that, that, uh, uh, that you know, might uh, be also for future thinking for, uh, for all of us in terms of computational approach in the first project, the one presented by Alifi, something that I was very uh, triggered uh, uh, was this combination, this use of, of the physical aspect, the light uh, and the trees uh, uh, for also to you know, bring back to a certain uh, understanding of values and, and, and memory and recreate for the, for the user uh, also a certain experience uh, that would allow to reconnect back to this memory. And then something that would really trigger me is okay do we have a computationally speaking something that can help us also 
better understanding uh, what would be the atmosphere that is, that is uh, uh, somehow allowing the user to more strongly connect uh, what is the, the combination of these ingredients, the light and the, the nature, the trees and so on, uh, and how can we explore uh, that combination in order to meet you know, uh, those, those uh, uh, a certain recreation of uh, emotions in uh, and I think like, Modeling emotion is something that we're still very far uh, in the computational realm, but is this something that, that we can somehow still use computation to help us better understanding? Uh, so it, it's more of a question, but it's something that, that would be nice to reflect for a next stage. Uh, the, oh, the project was uh, discussed by Sevilla um, in the hospitals, something that, uh, uh, um, well, th th there is actually a lot that has been uh, uh, researched on the complexity of the logistic and the uh, movement of uh, people as well as uh, uh, goods within uh, uh, hospitals is something which is uh, extremely complex. There is actually one uh, um, group within our uh, our team uh, that is mostly uh, the one working with uh, Dr. Pirus Nurian that is uh, also applying graph theory into the spatial configuration of hospitals and perhaps it might be interesting also to have a conversation with, with him or to uh, look at, uh, uh, at his work uh, uh, there. There are also plugins that they developed uh, um, together with Shervin Azadi for the environment of Grasshopper. So this is uh, just a, a side note. Uh, from my side, again, like what, uh, what I would be um, um, very triggered uh, uh, as future thinking uh, is, uh, is this combination on data that we might eventually have, I mean, the, the comfort within our, uh, hospitals, uh, and generally speaking, uh, what has to do with uh, special conditions, uh, like indeed the ones of patients uh, in hospital, is something which might possibly be uh, possible to research more and more also based on data. Um, is there a way in which we can actually still in the full respect of uh, uh, the you know, patient privacy and so on, collect data and information that would help us better understanding these special conditions uh, the, where uh, you know, people that are uh, in, in the hospital or that, that are experiencing certain illnesses uh, um, have and how do they perceive the space? Uh, so how can we even uh, extract information from these uh, to shape the garden, for example, the healing garden in a way that uh, is directly connected to research that is going on in uh, therapy, for example, uh, or uh, how can we provide comfort uh, in the rooms uh, where comfort goes outside the standard, uh, uh, more common uh, uh, comfort that we would, uh, for example, need in an office. There are special needs there, uh, and, and, and this is something that would, uh, would trigger my attention very much. On the project by Aziz and, and Chika uh, on the run and sit uh, combination, something that was liking very much for the use of this traditional local, uh, local materials reused from, uh, uh, from discarded elements, the, the bottles, the pallets, and so on. Um, something that, that was uh, really like driving my attention uh, was this idea of inclusive inclusiveness and engagement uh, of the collectivity. And I think that like, the space was really transmitting that very clearly. Uh, this, this idea of uh, uh, involving uh, uh, the, all the spectrum of the coll collectivity within your space. And then if I think of it uh, computationally speaking, I would be very interested to think, for example, on how could we uh, use uh, uh, computational means or even like uh, devices nowadays to let the users be part of the design process, nearly in a co-design, where, where you have this uh, idea of re reconfiguring the space. Uh, and perhaps it's even something that they can, uh, uh, where the computational part can help them uh, even like play in a, in, a, in a game scenario, right? With, uh, with something that would then enhance the experience uh, uh, of, uh, of this uh, um, collaborative process uh, in, in the community uh, thing. Um, in in uh, the project by uh, Arine, the traditional housing, the Durand part, uh, well, that was actually very uh, uh, triggered by uh, connecting to what we were already discussing uh, slightly earlier today um, in a uh, relation between physical parameters uh, and this idea of you know, traditional values, also just of cultural values. And I, I think like in this vernacular architecture, we always uh, uh, associate very much um, 
So th there is a, a, a lot of hidden knowledge uh, uh, in there. Uh, you were talking about also comfort and, and being sitting there uh, around those, uh, uh, those elements for uh, uh, comfortably uh, spending time together. Um, it's always a matter of, you know, using physical factors uh, also to shape uh, the local climate uh, versus the ones that would recreate again those uh, functions that aggregate uh, is something that would be uh, uh, really triggered in the computational uh, uh, perspective is uh, how can we use computation to uh, make even more explicit the investigation uh, of this relationship of the relation between the physical parameters like those all the numbers and the configuration the size the dimension that were recurrent and then the way in which they aggregate in the pattern with the effect that this would have on the local community so the use of the space and the use of the space, uh, again, in a physical sense, but also really in an aggregative uh, uh, manner. And I would be curious, therefore, if we can learn from the past uh, also on how those uh, uh, spaces can recreate uh, uh, this, uh, this aggregation and what are the, then the, the physical factors of them that play a, a higher role uh, on, on that. And our very last uh, um, uh, part of the project of EXA on uh, the historic uh, uh, beam system to, to uh, parametric uh, design, uh, very, very intriguing and quite, uh, quite deep research indeed. Uh, um, again, as a, as a note, uh, um, it might be possibly interesting uh, for you to look at the research that is being done in our group by the chair of GIS technology led by Peter van Osterholm. They are uh, indeed working very deeply with point cloud and on extracting information from point cloud and even connecting point cloud to be models. So that is a link that I see uh, potentially uh, clear in the, in the content and I would encourage a, a conversation with them as well. And from my side, what uh, I was triggered uh, on would be, um, well, we are more and more using machine learning for uh, uh, many different uh, aspects, uh, including uh, the understand or the better understanding of the information we extract from point cloud. Uh, this has to do with technical aspects, uh, really like uh, uh, recognizing uh, items that are relevant for what we have been scanning and what we want to transform into a model uh, um, and, and, and somehow filtering out the ones that are not relevant, but also in a deeper way, uh, categorizing, understanding what, what we are actually dealing with. So I wonder if this uh, uh, step and this transition from the point cloud to the beam to then the parametric part of it can eventually even help further in the object categorization by uh, yeah, the new potential that are being opened up with uh, machine learning techniques. So perhaps uh, a direction I might be interested to, to speak on uh, for the future. And I stop here, sorry, I was very brief and, and quite uh, just rushing through my thoughts uh, uh, just after having seen for the first time your project. So, I apologize if I might have missed uh, uh, or, or misunderstood some aspect of, uh, of your presentations, but just a, an open way of sharing uh, thoughts. Thank you very much, Dr. Michela, for the feedbacks. Uh, we are very delighted to be uh, responded by you. And then the next, uh, we will hear the summary of today's talk from Dr. Mirta. Uh, unfortunately, the time will be limited to three minutes, so I call upon Dr. Mikta to give the summary of today's event. Thank you. I'll try my best. Um, yeah, um, uh, basically, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, the presentation and talk uh, from uh, Professor Seville and also uh, uh, Professor Mikhail uh, for the inspiring talk and uh, presentations. And of course, uh, we can learn uh, so many things um, uh, during these events, uh, especially for the students. Um, so I guess uh, they can uh, grab some uh, relevant and also some uh, potential application of the in terms of um, uh, computational design methods, not only about the digital tools, but also the the um, how it can be related to the uh, future application architecture. So, uh, if I can uh, summarize um, uh, briefly the the talk and also the discussion that has been going on. So, basically, um, from the presentation of uh, Professor Michaela and Professor Schiffel, so uh, there there is a significant need of a collaborative process, not only from architecture but also from uh, other fields, uh, especially like uh, computer science. Um, 
and uh, other parts of engineering, uh, electrical and uh, building physics and others. So, so we need to uh, collaborate uh, in terms of um, to having uh, a complete overview of the uh, design methods for the for achieving the. So, for example, like um, uh, a green buildings or other kind of uh, intention uh, related to the to the uh, passive design strategies in the buildings. So, at least there are three uh parts so one is uh, from architectural designs and also the second one is uh, if we combine the architectural design uh, either intention and uh, other ideas from architects uh, which has been uh, presented uh, a lot by the students and also if we combine those uh, ideas to the uh, data and uh, information as uh, proposed by uh, professor Michaela, in terms of, for example, like climate, uh, geographical settings, the needs and physical parameter, if we can uh, extract the information about the how to param parameterize something and how many uh, relevant parameters that we, we need. So it can, by means of computational design, in this case, not only the tools, uh, not only the uh, uh, methods, but also the like performance simulation and also uh, uh, also mentioned about uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, and other kind of uh, computational methods. So we can, uh, for sure, uh, have a further geometric variations, not only uh, in terms of uh, uh, the buildings or the architectural uh, shapes, but also we can extract further to the uh, addictive manufacturing and also have more variations uh, in terms of like uh, the outputs such as uh, virtual reality or augmented reality, so there, there, there so there is significant um, needs for all of us to address this issue, uh, to to address this idea, so uh, to to make it more feasible by by uh, through the computational designs uh, method. And I guess that's that's the most important part. So we can uh, by today, so we can start to aware. So what what kind of uh, potential application that we can achieve as an architect or as a young generation of architects? Uh, so I would say uh, the student, you are the architects of tomorrow. So yeah, you can have that much more than today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the summary, uh, Dr. Mista. And now, uh, before we end the meeting today, we are going to hear the closing speech will be delivered by Mrs. India Martining Rom STMT. Uh, time is yours. You can start. Thank you, Azizi. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Uh, it's finally time to end this remarkable lecture. On behalf of the Department of Architecture, Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Brawijaya, I would like to give our honorable gratitude to Professor Seville and Dr. Michaela for their great sharing. It's such a precious opportunity to have the collaboration between Universitas Brawijaya and TU Delft. We do hope to have another academic collaboration with TU Delft in the future. And last but not least, we also thank all the audiences for joining the lecture, uh, this lecture, and the organizing committee for their hard work. We will still meet again in the second session of the guest lecture as a continuation of this first session. Thanks again, and I wish you all a blessed day. Thank you, Mrs. Inda, for the closing speech. Uh, so we are really at the end of the today's lecture let us all be guided by all the things we have learned and heard throughout the talk and be able to collaborate and uh, learn more in the future and remember there will be a second session of 31 talks again will be presented by dr michaela at 20th of october 2021 don't forget to join the next session i am azizi the master of ceremony and i'd like to say farewell to all of you and may all of you have a good day thank you very much for your attention assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh peace be upon you Thank you, Dr. Michela. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much to all of you. It's been really a wonderful uh, time together. Thank <laughs> you. Your presentation is, is awesome. <laughs> um.
Very Thank the... you very much, everyone. It's like it was really an honor for me to have uh, the opportunity to discuss together, and it's just the start. We will uh, keep doing so in so the next uh, next opportunity. Really, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michaela. Bye. Okay. Bye. See you. Thank you. Goodbye, Dr. Michaela. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you Good so evening. much. Thank you, Mister. Terima kasih Mas Mita. Terima kasih Mas Mita. <laughs> Sampai ketemu ya, lagi ya. Di tugas ya sama Bu Haji tadi ya. <laughs> <laughs> Tapi bagus lah, skenarionya bagus, bagus, bagus. Bisa ditiru untuk next session. <laughs> Terima kasih semua. Hati-hati <laughs> <laughs> ya, Mas Bubahan. Ya, Mas Anu. Okay. Nanti kita jabri-jabrian lagi untuk next session ya Mas Mita ya. Ya, ya, boleh, boleh. ya untuk kalau untuk koordinasi berikutnya. Oke, sekarang. sekarang break dulu. Terima kasih seluruh panitia. Terima kasih semuanya. Terima kasih semuanya. Terima kasih Mas Uta. Terima kasih semuanya. Terima kasih Dedi. Terima semuanya yang presentasi juga. Hey, semangat, ya. Bud. Ya. Terima kasih panitia. Terima kasih Bu Acil. Bu Acil terima kasih banyak. Ya, wes istirahat dulu. Terima kasih Bu Acil. Ya, Alin. Ya. Terima kasih Bapak Ibu. Ya, sama-sama. Ya, terima kasih Bapak Ibu. Ya. Ya, tetap semangat. Terima kasih, Alin. Terima kasih, Terima kasih, Azizi.